know the rich grace that was imparted to you through Christ's baptism as he sanctified the water so that we too, when we are baptized, would be made children of God. Amen. Please bow your heads with me and let us go to our Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for making holy the waters of baptism, that you have placed your name upon each of our hearts as we were washed and made your children. We pray, O Lord, that you will lead us and guide us each and every day, that we would live out that baptismal faith, the promise that you have given to us, that we might live as your children in this world, that all may know the promised hope and salvation that comes in you. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I don't know about you all, but I suspect many of your kitchens are like mine. If you go to the kitchen sink, you'll notice there's a window carefully placed right above it. Sometimes it's not centered perfectly, but most kitchens have a window right above the sink. And I don't know about you, but there are times when I'll be doing dishes. Maybe I have to scrape a little extra oatmeal off Jacob's breakfast bowl because it didn't soak. Or maybe I'll be uh, scrubbing a difficult pan. And I'll kind of lose focus on what I'm doing. And I'll kind of glance out that window. Have any of you ever done that before? You just kind of stare off. Maybe you notice the birds that were recently disturbed and they kind of swirl up into the sky. Maybe you kind of notice the sunset, maybe especially with the clouds, how the way the sun lights those clouds. Maybe it's just you stare off and you notice God's creation all around you. Some of you, I imagine, though, have done what I have. And in just a moment, as you're staring off, you notice yourself staring back at you. Your reflection in the glass. You notice for just a minute your reflection staring back at you as if plastered to those birds swirling up into the sky or painted on the sunset. Your own face there as well. Have any of you ever felt that before? It's kind of, kind of neat when that happens, isn't it? Because for a minute, you can forget that you're doing your chores, cleaning your dishes. For a minute, you can forget that you have bills to pay, you have other things that you have to do around the house. For a minute, maybe like those birds, you can feel a bit of freedom thinking about those birds who are not bound to a house, not bound to one place, but are free. Small reflection, just a little glance. You know, today, that's what we're going to do is take a small reflection into God's Word. You know, we, go, we get into Romans 6 today. That is a text that is used for the baptism of Christ, that's used for many baptisms. And as we look at it, we enter into the story in the middle. Have you ever noticed that it's uh, our pericopes? They don't always go one chapter to the next, but we get right into the middle of the story. It's almost like the way that we live our lives. As we reflect back on this Roman text in Romans, we know that we are not the first ones here. That although we're part of God's story, that we've come later in time. That God's story began before there was time. That God's go- story will stretch beyond time. And here we are, smack dab in the middle. Just like Romans chapter 6 is. Romans 6, though, talks about our beginning as the children of God. It talks about baptism. And Paul paints this amazing picture of baptism. He paints this picture of baptism that draws us to something greater than ourselves, that draws us beyond the mundane of our lives and draws us to something beautiful. He takes us away from those things that hold us back and reminds us that we are part of a greater story, a hope. And so no matter where you came from this morning, no matter if you had a busy week last week or if you have a lonely week ahead of you where you don't know exactly what you're going to do, Paul invites us to peer back with him, to reflect on what baptism means to us, what it means to be called a child of God. And Paul, he uses these beautiful words to describe baptism. And I take you back to Romans 6, and I encourage you to read with me. I'm going to start at verse 3 here. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might have new life. Baptism is the promise of new life. Baptism is the promised hope that we have that there is something greater than this life. And let's go back to the context for just a minute here. The people to whom Paul was first writing. He's writing to that Roman church, wasn't he? And if you remember anything about the Roman church, you know that these were people who were already, not just soon to face persecution, they were already facing persecution. And he wanted to give them a glimpse of hope. 
he wanted to give them a glimpse of what is to come. And so he reminded them that what is on this earth is not all that there is. But there is something greater. There is a greater hope that is ahead of each one of us. He wrote to this church who he never even met. Do you remember that? that Paul, he wrote to the Romans. And he was a missionary letter because he'd not had opportunity to get to them yet. So he wrote from the church in Corinth to encourage them. Because he had heard about the way God was working. He had already heard about what God was doing. And he wanted to give them further encouragement, further strengthening. Remind them that all the things that are falling apart in their lives, that there was still hope. There was still a bright light of Christ shining through. Because they were baptized children of God. Now Paul, he's so specific in baptism, isn't he? He says that we have gone from death to life. We, have gone, we, were, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but we have been brought to life. Now for us as Lutherans, we are not always familiar with Romans 6 as well as we are with Romans 7, are we? It seems like we know, the, we know the, that baptismal text when we have a baptism in church. But then most of us, we fast forward to Romans 7, and we can't help but think about Paul's words in Romans 7 where he says the struggle against the flesh, the, the, the good I wish to do, I do not do, the evil I do not wish to do, I do. I thought most of you all knew this one, but it's because it seems like for many of us that's our theme verse. You know, we read Romans 3, and we say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's like our Lutheran Bibles are stuck together. The pages are stuck together. And we turn right to Romans 7 where it says, the, sin, the struggle against our flesh, the good that I wish to do, I do not do. Even Luther, if you remember his writing, he did this as well, didn't he? He talked about the struggle of the flesh. Schimmel used to et peccata, right? At the same time, sinner and saint. He struggled with that. But Paul, he gives us a better way to look at life. We were dead in our trespasses, but we've been made alive in Christ. Dead in our sins, but now alive in Christ. The old has been put behind us. The old is no longer hanging over our head before us. But in our baptism, we drown the old self. We put to death that sinfulness and have been made alive by Christ. But Sometimes that's hard for us, isn't it? In fact, as people who live in our world today, this is a particular struggle because the world actually tells us the opposite. It says that you need to hold on to your sin so that it keeps you from repeating it. We know that the world, they may not know what sin is, but they certainly know what evil is. If you were to ask anybody about a DUI that kills a child, they would call that evil, wouldn't they? If they were to talk about uh, a massacre in Iraq or Afghanistan, they would call that evil. It wouldn't matter if they'd ever been in church before. But the solution of the world, the solution of the world tells us that all you have to do is hold on to that. Remember that sin. Keep it in your back pocket because then you won't repeat it. Isn't that what the cliche is? Those who know history, or those who do not know history are doomed to repeat history. And so the world gives us this idea that we have to hold on to that sin. That although we're, we're supposedly we drowned it in our baptism, we better hold on to it so we don't get into it again. And we fall into this trap. We do. How many of us in our own lives find ourselves going back over our sins that we've confessed to God? How many of us in our lives find ourselves going back over our lives thinking, I wish I would have done this or I wish I wouldn't have done that? full of regret, full of that wonderment. Well, Paul, he gives us another, another answer. Paul says, put it behind us. Put that sin behind you. You know, the world, though, it, it seems like that's the easier answer, though, is to hold on to it. I don't know if any of you have even heard of it or much less visited it, but in Los Angeles and actually three other places throughout the country, there's this place called the Museum of Tolerance. Has anybody been to the Museum of Tolerance or at least heard of it? Well, the Museum of Tolerance in L.A., if you go, when you get in, first of all, the tour is very structured. And you walk in and, it's, it's, and you first are greeted, greeted by the streets of Nazi Germany. 
You're reminded of all the hateful things that happened, all the awful things. And as you go through this tour, you're taken from one place to the next. The lights go down in one, the lights come up in another. You're greeted by scene of hate after scene of hate. Reminders of evil that have, ha have plagued the human race throughout the 20th century. Near the end of the tour, men and women are split up into two separate groups. Men will go off into the one line, women the other. And they'll go into these rooms that are similar to gas chambers. They have a large concrete slab in the center, making it very uncomfortable. And then in the darkness of this room, they start flashing images of the way we have humans, as humans, have treated one another. The way that we've treated other humans like cattle, the evils that we've done against one another. Suddenly the room opens up. There's a great brilliance of light. And you're greeted by, and this changes, but an image of tolerance. You're greeted by an image of reminding us of what one person can do. Now that falls right in line with the world's thinking, doesn't it? Better remember those things. You don't want to repeat them. But Paul, he says, no. Put those things behind you. In your baptism, those things were washed away. In your baptism, God cleaned you and made you whiter than snow. It's as if Paul takes us down this dark, deep path. Because if you read the rest of Romans, you know he talks about the power and dominion of sin. He talks about its enslavement of us and the control it has. And in Paul, he takes you down this dark, deep path. Not like the Museum of Tolerance, but rather much darker, where there's no lights. Because isn't that what the path of sin leads? To deep, deep darkness. As if imprisoned. Imprisoned until we feel the trickling of water on our foreheads. Imprisoned by sin until the water spills down our faces. As the pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then a light greater than any light we can imagine comes into our hearts and our lives. The light of Christ's redemption. The light and promise of the resurrection. Not the light of this world, but true light that pierces the darkness of our sinfulness. That truly breaks free. Breaks us free from the prison of sin and death. Sets us free to be the people of God. Sets us free to live as His people with hope. Knowing that we have been bought with the price of His blood. Bought with the price of Jesus' death on the cross. Not so that we would remain dead, but rather so that as Christ has died to sin, that we too, and we die with Him, that we too shall rise with Him. That we have the hope and promise of the resurrection. That we have the hope and promise that this life is not all there is, but as baptized children of God, God has a place for you in His kingdom. And that is the true hope that we have. That we reflect on when we look into the waters of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. As most of you know, I did my seminary training at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And on the campus, there sits the chapel of St. Timothy and Titus. From a distance, it looks like it might be a little taller than all the rest of the buildings. That might just be perception. On the back wall, there are two beautiful stained glass windows, one of St. Timothy and one of St. Titus. But if you come forward just a little bit in the chancel area, you'll see the pulpit. And right behind the pulpit, much like ours, there's a crucifix. Now, I'll be honest, I never really cared for this crucifix. Not that I have a problem with crucifixes in general, but this one has a, it was clear glass. Transparent if you look at it, except for one spot. And if you remember in Exodus where it talks about Moses holding up the snake on the pole, it has Jesus in the shape of a snake, almost in the writhing pain on the cross, with one red dot behind him. That cross, it's transparent. But now and again, much like we do, once in a while, they'll bring the cross down from behind the pulpit. They'll walk it to the back of the church. And, and when you walk into the chapel of St. Timothy and St. Titus, the baptismal font's right there as a reminder that we are baptized children of God. And that cross then is brought back to the baptismal font. It is connected to the baptismal font. And that cross then, something beautiful happens as it's brought in the church, as it's brought in as the, by the procession. It, instead of being transparent, if you look, you can see 
you can see the world brought into the cross. If you look, you can see people singing and hearts lifted in anticipation as the cross goes by. And if you look close, you can see your own eyes staring back at you reflected in that cross. Reflected in that promise. And that's how it is being part of God's story. We're part of his cross, part of his death. But because we're baptized, we're part of the resurrection as well. The promise that we too will die, but we will rise. And although we enter the story late, he's still going to has purpose and use for us in this world and in this life. That we are those who have been made righteous so that we can share his hope with all those in our world. For you were dead in your sins and trespasses, but you are alive in Christ. Amen. Please bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your crucifixion and your death, for your promise that as you have died, that you did not remain in that tomb, but you have conquered death, and that you have declared victory, that you have risen from the grave. And we thank you that because you have died on the cross, that you have paid for our sins, that you have drowned them and put them to death, so that we are now made alive in you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will lead us each day, that we would live lives, lives righteous in your name. Lives that reflect your love. Lives that show hope to this world around us. We thank you for the promise that we are part of your greater story. That we are part of this life that one day will be with you forever. May our lives truly reflect your love and the hope of our salvation. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.